for the Melbert B. Carey Graphic Arts Collection at Rochester Institute of Technology. Okay, so you're calling yourself a collection rather than a library. Correct. Yeah. We are a library, certainly. We're a rare book library, but we also collect a lot of different things like uh, primary source archives, like personal papers, um, but also a lot of technology, too. We have a lot of historic printing presses and the accoutrements that would go with um, a 19th century print shop. Fred Gowdy was um, the quintessential American typeface designer. He designed over 100 different faces. Um, he was also an author. He was a great speaker. Um, and he was a man who could do almost anything he set his mind to. He, he cut his own typefaces in, in, addition, to, in addition to designing them. Um, he brought it all into his own hands where he, he set up a printing workshop, a type founding workshop at a place called Deep Dean in Marlboro on Hudson, New York. So he had his hand in a lot of different crafts surrounding printing and type founding. For instance, the item that I have in front of me here is the guest book of the Woolly Whale Press. And the Woolly Whale Press was run by Melbert B. Carey, who we get our namesake from. And Carey was an importer of metal typefaces, and his company was called the Continental Typeface Association, Type Founders Association. And this was his, his own private press? Yes, yeah. the press of the Woolly Whale. And in the Continental Type Founders Association, um, he was importing metal type from Europe to the United States, and at one point, in order to get the cachet of the greatest 20th century type designer in America, he employed Gowdy to be his vice president and artistic director. Okay. So here is uh, the, the press's, the Woolly Whale Press's guest book, and there's a lot of wonderful people in here. In, in addition, here's Bruce Rogers on this first page. But um, this chronicles the time period of 1928 through 41, and the first two people to sign it are Fred Gowdy and his wife Bertha, who was also a very talented, she was a, his compositor. An associate of Gowdy, his name was Charles Pont. So we have a lot of letters from Gowdy to Pont discussing orders that Pont would have made of typefaces, discussing, Pont was also a biographer of Gowdy at one time. So as the correspondence goes on, we see the relationship blossoming. I have one of the first letters here from 1936 where it's very, very, very curt and just thank you very much for your letter and then it gets more personal as we go on. So we see this this portrait of this exuberant man that Gaudi was. How would uh, most people come in contact with what Gaudi did? Well, um, I think the way you would come in contact is through digital typefaces because a lot of uh, his faces, which were done in the 20th, early 20th century, um, have been digitized or revived into a format that we can use on our computers. So if you uh, have a, on your font list, you have Gaudi old style. When you drop down in Microsoft Word or InDesign or whatever you use, that is a face that has been digitized from an original Gaudi design. Okay. And um, there are certain people, Gaudi fanatics and scholars, who are still reviving different faces, um, of which you may have heard of uh, Kennerly, which was done for Mitchell Kennerly, and uh, Californian, which was done for University of California Press. So those are some very well-known ones that Gabby has done. And you've got some of his actual printing presses here too, you right? I do. Um, that's a, a wonderful boon, is that it, it's not only books and papers that we have here, but um, we have evidence with a photograph that one of the Albion printing presses that we have was actually in Gaudi's workshop on Deep Dean in Marlboro on Hudson, and he would pull his proofs from it, mm. from the different types that he was creating there. So it's a great legacy to, to have papers, but also these kind of artifacts. Here's like a, a die that would have been used for foil stamping mm. with Gaudi's emblem, and you can see it in this book called The Alphabet, which was one of his very well-known books. You can see that design. So we have one of the dies that he would have used for book binding. In early his career, he did a lot of book design. I happen to have one of the works that he designed um, the cover for, and this is, we have it not so much because it was done by Fred Gowdy, but we have a nice collection of uh, publisher's trade bindings from the late 1800s, early 1900s. This work on the alphabet that I just showed came out in uh, 1922, so he had been doing more design. And this is pre 
type design. This is a hand letter design here on this cover. Yeah, did he not come to typesetting a bit later in life? He did. He was a bookkeeper originally. And yeah. it's, it's a funny you know, story how he was uh, influenced in Chicago. He was from the Midwest and then um, came to, to type design later in his life. Certainly a lot of self-teaching too. Um, a lot of influence from his avid reading, uh, coming to see books such as this and, and wanting to do that kind of thing. So, so some people, they either, in his time, they either loved him or they thought he was a phony, a fake. He brought too much of himself to the designs. He didn't have a true, when he was reviving a type style, he introduced a lot of anachronism into like a medieval design or um, a trade, something based on the Trajan column. So it wasn't pure historic typeface revival. It had a little bit of Him. gouty in it. Yeah. So, so some people thought that um, that was not a desirable thing to introduce to his type design. One of the technology collections we have are the lost gouty types. So I've mentioned this mill that he worked at called Deep Dean. And it was burned down in a fire in 1939. So a lot of the drawings, a lot of the um, matrices and molds that would make his types it was all destroyed in that fire. And the only things that were left uh, were certain collections of the metal type in various private collections. And one of them, this gentleman, his name is Kagashal, who was a printer that Gaudi used, had a certain quantity of Gaudi's types. And you got those. And we have them. Finally, uh, what's his legacy? He was able to analyze a historical typeface form and then make it relevant for his time. And he could do so in such a prolific fashion that he was well as well versed in medieval manuscript styles as um, contemporary modern typefaces. So he, was, he really had a broad scope of, around typography. And I see a lot of students who are engaged in design studies now who are trying to re uh, vibe different type styles or create their own new typefaces. And I think they have a lot to learn from the work of someone such as Gaudi who could be so versed in so many different type styles in this world where we have everything available to us at our fingertips.